Welcome everyone to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm the Executive Vice President here. We're so honored today to have uh, Michael Kramer, who's the Gates Professor of Developing Societies in the Department of Economics at Harvard University, and the 2019 co-recipient for economics, um, the Nobel Prize for economics, which he shares with Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee for their experimental approach to alleviating poverty. Um, you know, Michael works in all of the important sectors, poverty, health, education, uh, water, sanitation, the things that make a difference for people's lives. We're so, so proud that Michael has been a huge part of the Center for Global Development since its inception um, and was the brains behind a really important idea called the Advanced Market Commitment for Vaccines, which was not even mentioned by the Nobel Committee. <laughs> even though it's saved millions of kids' lives. So, I mean, we're just so honored that you have decided to come here. He'll be interviewed today by a classmate of his and who's now also an amazing economist in his own right from Harvard University um, and who has recently done an incredible summary of 100 papers of Michael Kramer that you can follow in one tweet thread. So without further ado, I invite uh, these incredible people up to the stage. Thanks. Well, congratulations on winning the, uh, the Nobel. Just to clarify, I was not actually a classmate of Michael Kramer's, but I was a student. He famously wrote a paper about, um, about the history of uh, the world from a million BC to 1990, and it was somewhere in that period that Michael was my advisor in graduate school. Um, so I'd love to, there's a quote that I've, I've actually never seen written by you, but I've heard attributed to you, which is, uh, never apologize that your fundamental motivation is to improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people and that economics is a tool to get there and not an end in itself. And so with that in mind, I'd love to kind of start way back. So you finished college in 1985 and you majored in social studies. And I'm, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got into development and how you got into economics from there. Sure, um, well, um, let me say, I, I think economics and science, maybe more generally, if you want to call economics a form of science. I think that is an end in itself. But I think, um, I also think that addressing practical problems in the world, and particularly the, the terrible problems of world poverty, is a very important end in itself. And I also don't think that there's a conflict between acknowledging what I think is true for the majority of development economists, that they are motivated by the, the latter as well as the former. Um, um, and I guess to answer your question about you know, what motivated me to work in international development, I think, and uh, you know, I think that really came, uh, that came before my interest in economics. I wasn't an undergraduate economics major. I think you know, that came, and I, I spent a year teaching in Kenya, as you know, but it wasn't that I spent a year teaching in Kenya and that got me interested in development. I think the, you know, the fundamental reason I'm interested in development, I think you know, I've heard uh, you know, Esther say similar things in Abhijit. Um, you know, it's a, I think we have a moral obligation when there, are, when there are people who are suffering or dying even, and when there's something that we can do about it to, to get involved. And, um, and you know, I probably thought about that, you know, I felt that way for a long time since uh, being a kid, and I, I'm sure I thought about that in an incredibly naive way then, and I probably still think about that in a naive way, but I think there's, there's something something there. And then I, I got interested in economics because it was a useful tool and, and credential. And I, I liked economics as an undergrad, but then when I got to graduate school, I found out that I you know, really liked it. And, uh, and I completely, um, you know, the, I guess I tend to come thinking about things from, uh, I tend to personally just get motivated by the practical problems and then, but I hope that sheds light on, on you know, issues of broader applicability, and obviously the work that uh, that theorists do, like uh, Eric Maskin or Al Roth, you know, they're thinking about it probably at least some, some extent from the straight theory side. But their work winds up being very useful in practical problems as well. So I don't, I don't, uh, I think we need to apologize for whatever motivates us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some people. Do. 
Well, it seems like economics likes you pretty well as well. Um, so obviously, like, like Amanda mentioned, and everybody knows, the, uh, the stated motivation for the Nobel was in part this experimental approach to alleviating poverty. So, you know, you go back to your first experiments in economics on women's groups and schools, deworming and flip charts in Western Kenya. So how did you go from being a, you know, being a teacher in Western Kenya after undergrad to running experiments? Like, where did, where did that idea first come from? Well, um, you know, I, I was involved in setting up an NGO uh, uh, that arranged for Americans to teach overseas as, uh, after, after um, you know, the experience as a teacher. And then I went to graduate school. Um, after I got my first job and you know, could afford to, uh, to go back to Kenya, I went back on vacation you know, with my wife and visited Kenyan friends of mine. And, um, and one of those friends was now work, was at that point working for an NGO. He had been a, a headmaster of a school, but he was working for an NGO. And they were just starting to work in Western Kenya. They hadn't worked there before. They're a very small NGO, very uh, you know, limited resources. But, and they weren't 100% sure what, you know, they had various ideas about what would be effective. And they weren't sure what would be more effective. And they, and, you know, we were talking and we came up with the idea that you know, maybe they could try multiple approaches. And if they structured the way they tried multiple approaches so that some, you know, so that, Ideally, to make the, the the have places that were schools that were very comparable, but di but where different approaches were tried and they rigorously measured the impact, then they could understand what the impact was of different approaches and go with what was most effective. And because they were very small, they were naturally have to and they were growing. They naturally had to phase in their programs. And again, if you if you take advantage of the order of phase in and you plan that out systematically. You could have a comparable group that's, uh, that gets the program in year one, and another one in year two, and another one in year three. And then if you compare partway through, you can isolate the impact of the, of the program from, any, from confounding uh, factors. And so that's, um, that's, you know, they, I actually flew back to the US. It was the end of my vacation. And, uh, and he said he would talk to his boss. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a call saying, yeah, we're going to do it, and so I uh, went back to Kenya and talked to them about it, and uh, and you know that's 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 the that's how I got involved in this. Um, so why at that? So at that point, people had been, you know, there was some impact evaluation. People had been, you know, you have some schools that do something, and you pick some other schools that seem kind of comparable. Mm -hmm. So why randomization at that juncture? Like that wasn't common practice at the time. Yes. Um, you know, that's, that's something, I'll tell you, at that juncture, the reason was we were interested in trying to understand causal impact. And I think economists were dreaming up, you know, clever way after clever way to try to control for all the possible confounding factors. <laughs> but then we would realize that, no, that, that you, you've still not controlled for them all. And it's almost impossible to make sure that you've, you've controlled for them all. But if you have a randomized trial, for example, obviously this is widespread practice in medicine, then you can isolate the impact. And I don't want to minimize the difficulties of, of doing a randomized trial in practice. All sorts of things can go wrong. Uh, they're, they're hard work. But, um, the, um, but um, that, was, um, that, you know, that was the initial motivation. But I think that, as I reflect on it now, I think that the, the true contribution was much broader than that. Um, because you know, the way that economists have most, and I don't want to overgeneralize, um, there are some you know, very important exceptions to this, but the standard way that economists had, had worked was to take a, a, either just a pure theory or take a data set that somebody else collected and then analyze that data. And sometimes with very little knowledge of the context. And you know, doing a randomized trial involves spending a lot of time in the you know in the field talking to you know whether it's farmers or teachers or students or NGO workers or government officials people who who know the context intimately and that gives a much richer sense of what's going on and I think a big advantage of that is that you know those other people have very useful information and very useful thoughts and the Economists tend to think, like everybody, we have certain ways of thinking about the world. 
And it's easy to get trapped in those. And I, I just want to be clear, I'm not saying that those ways are wrong and the other ways are right. I, but I think it's just any one way is limited. So you know, to take the concrete example, I, as we were talking about at lunch, you know, I was motivated in part by reading some of the education literature. And you know, there's a debate. And very crudely, you can think of this as a debate between conservatives and liberals. And liberals say, we want to spend more money on education. Education is really important. Let's hire more teachers. Let's pay them more. Let's get more things in schools. And the conservatives were, money doesn't make a difference, and, the, and what really counts is incentives, and we need merit pay for teachers, and we need school choice. And I think there's, you know, that's a, and I had, I thought, well, let's, let's, and there was this same attempt to sort of tease things out statistically, and I felt it wasn't completely satisfactory. And, you know, I think we learned something about that debate, but we, at the same time, I think we learned that there were much more important factors that we weren't really thinking about. So, um, you know, um, here's an example of that. You know, one of the earliest uh, uh, pieces of work that we did in evaluating the NGO's programs was an NGO program to provide textbooks. So this was, Kenya was very poor, and, you know, even a real skeptic about inputs and spending more money like Eric Kanyashek sort of thought, well, look, textbooks are going to be useful. And, you know, and they're cheap, and you know, so, so, uh, um, so we looked at it, and when we looked at the average test scores of, of students, we saw, just grouping them all together, we actually didn't see a statistically significant increase. You know, there was something, but it wasn't statistically significant. And you know, I thought about that, and it was a mystery for a while, and then I thought back to my time as a teacher in Kenya, and you know, and also just what I knew about the context. And you know, school in Kenya is taught in English. This, in this rural area, that's most kids' third language. And the you know, kids are missing school all the time. They're sick. They're, they're maybe needed at home to look after siblings. Um, you know, kids, when I say they're sick, it's not just colds. They have malaria. They have worms. They have, uh, their parents are you know, dying of AIDS, and they need to look after, after the sibling. Um, and the teachers are missing school a lot, as, as, uh, as, as I think you know, we now know. And in that context, it's very easy to fall behind. And if you fall behind, you're not going to benefit from a curriculum that's just as, you know, just as rigorous as any other cu curriculum internationally, and that is written in your third language. And so what we, we looked at said, well, how are we going to test that hypothesis? And what we did is we looked at the pre-test pre, uh, pre scores, and we saw for those kids in the bottom three quarters of the distribution and the uh, treatment schools that got textbooks, they they didn't score really any differently than the than the kids in the in the in the in just, you know, comparison <coughs> set of schools. But for the kids who were in the top of the initial distribution, we did see this big gain from uh, from textbooks. So that, and I think that you know, relates to you know another point. You know, there's often a feeling that RCTs are you know, mechanical, and they don't tell you what's going on. And I agree, one RCT doesn't really do that. But once you get one, um, you know, they can generate very interesting hypotheses. And so, and thinking about the context, there's all these political economy factors that lead education to be focused on the very, the very strongest students and you know, kids of the of more advantaged parents who can handle that curriculum with no problem at all because they're not missing school all the time and their teachers are probably more likely to show up. So the so that I think pointed to sort of some fundamental issues not just in Kenya but in many many countries' education systems. Um, that so oh, that you know there's a some people see um, see uh, randomized trials as sort of looking at very small issues. But I think this is actually a fundamental element of the political economy of education in developing countries. That doesn't mean that the re RCT result is going to change that, because there's groups that, you know, middle class parents in Kenya want the best education for their kids, just like I want the best education for my kids. They don't want the, they might not want a wholesale revamping of the curriculum. But, you know, if you're politically radical, you'd say, you got to do that or nothing. If you're, if you're more less radical or more pragmatic, you know, another thing that you could do is you could take that same result and you could say, well, are there things that we could do within the structure of the existing system? And it turns out, and this was subsequent work by, by uh, 
Abhijit Banerjee and, Sean, and uh, Sean Cole and Esther Duflo and Lee Linden and you know, many other people, a whole series of studies. If you provide remedial education, those kids who had fallen very far behind can actually catch up remarkably quickly. And once they can get to the point where they can understand what's going on in class, then they can, then they can benefit along with all the other kids. So that's something that in this particular case, I don't want to say that's the solution to the problem. Maybe fundamental change is needed. I'm not a politician, I'll, I'll stay away from that question. But you know, there are things that, there are, it turns out, you, know, you uncover fun, fundamental things about polit political economy, but you also maybe come up with some practical solutions that don't require full-scale changes in, in political economy. And indeed, you know, I think five million kids in India are now benefiting from this type of uh, targeted, you know, remedial education targeted instruction approach, and, uh, you know, efforts are expanding in, in African countries as well. So, I think that, that makes great sense. Obviously, at the very beginning, when you started doing these randomized controlled trials, I remember, I think a lot of people in this room remember, that there was a lot of pushback from other economists. There's a nice quote from a, a paper that you wrote just a couple years ago with uh, um, Duflo and Banerjee. Um, a reflection of the fact uh, is that many researchers who were openly skeptical of RCTs or simply belong to an entirely different tradition within development economics are now involved in one or more randomized controlled trials in a developing country. So, you know, what kind of pushback did you get at the beginning of this movement and why? So, um, so I'll, I'll mention for those of you who uh, know the field, somebody who, you know, might seem like a strange source of pushback, and I wouldn't quite call it pushback, but uh, Dean Carlin. Yes. Okay, you a known strong opponent of randomized trials. <laughs> you know, it may not have been who you're thinking I was going to mention, no. He was a student at the time, and he said to me, can I do this? I have this idea, I want to try it, but like, isn't it too simple? Like, I won't get any points for that. And, you know, I said, don't worry about that. It'll, and I think Dean's done okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, you know, I, I think the truth is that once you, these, you know, in some ways, I think we, maybe we made a mistake at the beginning because we emphasized that, look, this way you can, it's simple, you can understand what's going on, it's transparent to everybody, but it's, it's hard work. And in the process, you realize things that you didn't go in thinking about. And the, the, as the education example I just talked about, that wasn't, I mean, I was about what's the impact of resources, but I realized that was, that's still a valid question, but maybe a more important question was the mismatch between, you know, the, the need for targeted instruction. Um, the, um, so, you know, I think Dean has found, you know, I, I mentioned a particular paper of Dean, which I think is very exciting. You know, it's, it's not, I think we've gotten beyond even that point. So I'm always arguing, well, we find new things. But now there's a bunch of research, and, you know, uh, Dean's uh, famous paper with Zinman in Econometrica, this uses, tries to, comes up with techniques for separating out uh, uh, what's called moral hazard and adverse selection, two things that have been you know, the object of uh, intense interest in economic theory, but are very hard in a non-experimental context to separate from each other. And these are key to financial markets, uh, a lot of theories of financial markets, and they were able to devise an experiment to measure them. So there's an increasing you know, convergence. I think the most of the debates about you know, do we want RCTs or do we want theory, you know, I hope those are, are dying down. I think we need all of the above. We need some RCTs just to measure impact. We need some theory just for the sake of theory. And then there's a huge area where we can combine, and you know, I, I'm certainly very excited about where we combine RCTs and theory. So then just to push on that a little bit, mm -hmm. so some of your most famous papers are non-experimental papers. Mm -hmm. the, a model of economic growth, the O-ring theory paper, and the, I have to always, the, the population growth and technological, technological change mm -hmm. from a million BC to 1990. Um, I'm waiting for the update, <laughs> 1990 to 2019. Um, but like, how do you see the interaction then between these kind of big sweeping theories and then what is, you know, what Duflo talks about as kind of the plumbing, right? Like right. figuring out a lot of these details of how to get, you know, how to get this distribution of textbooks right or, you know, matching things up. So let me, let me um, respond at several levels. So one is, I think, in, for my research, I, I think a big unifying theme is you know, technological change and innovation. Um, 
I was a uh, you know, I was a student and a graduate student in the '90s when you know, a lot of the profession was very focused, I think rightly, on the issue of economic growth. And you know, one of the, and you know, speaking of recent Nobel prizes, you know, Paul Romer had this wonderful. Uh, you know, I don't want to claim that it was you know, he invented this out of whole cloth, but he really understood and made clear the importance of technological change and ideas, and and that has to be what drives economic growth overall in the long run. And, the, and so that made me very interested in, in technological change and, and innovation. And we talked about advanced market commitments, which CGD obviously had a huge role in. Um, and um, and you know, that was, uh, I started working on first patent buyouts uh, and then you know, moved over to advanced market commitments because of that understanding of the importance of innovation. And the, I think RCTs can be seen as a particular type of, of innovation. As I've argued, they're not just about getting causality. They're really changing the production function for economics from something that's entirely, you know, that's overwhelmingly driven from within the profession to something that's, I think, much more involves teams of people, involves inputs from practitioners, and that involves uh, input from other social sciences as well. Um, I, I don't think that's entirely a coincidence, or not just social sciences, you know, health experts, education experts. And the, um, the, so that I think is, you know, we've seen a big growth of this, of this, you know, there are now so many researchers doing this, and I think it's, a, it's not a replacement for the other ways of producing economics, but it's, it's an addition to our toolkit for ways of, of producing, uh, uh, producing economics and you know, science and innovation more generally. So I, I, I guess the first response would be, I, I see this as all of a, of a piece. Um, the second response would be, you know, as I indicated with the textbook example, you know, sometimes doing, you know, if I think about the big revolution in, 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 in macroeconomics from, um, you know, from from a earlier period, you know, dating back to the 80s, you know, it was trying to develop micro foundations for macroeconomics. And I think um, there's you know, widespread under, you know, agreement that we should try to do that. Um, you know, that's hard, but, and I guess I would take the textbook example, that's not foundation for macroeconomics, but that is a foundation for understanding larger political economy issues with, the, with education systems. Um, that I, I think are you know pretty fundamental, um, and then I guess the final thing I would say is that you know my my own view is that you know we're also just trying to produce you know better ways of uh, of you know delivering uh, you know delivering clean water to people and um, and the and I think that's totally fine like yes you know we want economic growth in the long run and that's the most important thing in the long run no question about it you know person who's done the most to alleviate poverty worldwide is Deng Xiaoping, I think. Uh, um, the, um, but the, the, you know, in the meantime, people are dying because they're not getting clean water. And if, if you can find ways to get clean water to them, that's, that's very important. And you know, it turned out that some of the experiments that were done on preventive health, you know, uh, my, my own work with Ted Miguel on on deworming, finding you know, the impact of charging for deworming is a, even a tiny amount is a radical reduction in the number of people who get the worm medicine. Uh, the work of uh, Pascaline Dupont and Jessica Cohen on, on mosquito nets. Time after time, it turns out people are not, there's making even a small charge. You know, people, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, people were very certain, maybe more recently, people were very seriously saying you have to charge for, for preventive health because if you, if you, you know, otherwise people will, use, will get it who aren't going to use it properly or we need to raise some revenue. Well, it turns out that charging even a little bit leads to massive reductions in the number of people who get preventive health. You don't wind up raising that much money because not very many people are getting it um, and, you know, with very negative health consequences. So that's an example of how, you know, possible explanations for that are behavioral. I tend to be pretty sympathetic to those, you know, other people would argue, you know, other things. But we tried to take advantage of a whole set of fundamental insights in, from behavioral economics to design an approach, one element of which was making it free, but also trying to make it as convenient as possible, um, trying to make it as, as um, you know, public so that people can, social norms can form. 
And the basic idea was to put water treatment solution, instead of selling that for in, in small containers for households to use uh, at home, put a, a public container and make it free at the water point so when people are collecting their water, they can just turn a tap, get the, put, put the right amount of water treatment solution in their, in their uh, water collection uh, container. And, uh, and you do that to sort of build up a habit of doing that whenever they collect their water. And it turns out that took uh, water treatment rates from 7% to about 50%. So that's, um, and, and in a sustained way. Um, so that's, that's an example of where you know, we took some more general insights, but applied them and, um, you know, and look, if we can get that impact, you know, that's great. And I guess deworming would be another example. You know, that's something that we're finding um, you know, income gains and um, uh, you know, the kids who are dewormed, uh, people who are dewormed as kids, when they become young adults, they're, they get increases in wages, they get uh, increases in consumption as a result. Uh, girls are more likely to go on to secondary school. You know, all of these things do contribute to economic growth. I'm not saying they're going to turn you know, Kenya into Singapore, but you know, maybe a lot of small things are going to help turn Kenya, as well as some big things will turn Kenya into Singapore, and, um, and each one of them helps. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a couple things you just mentioned. You mentioned deworming and then the advanced market commitments uh, for vaccines. One of the things that I noticed as I went through uh, you know, a lot of the work you've done is that on each of those two topics, you've written a lot, like more than a dozen papers on each of those. So how do you think about I don't know. I mean, this is maybe more of a personal question. Like, I write a paper, and then I'm like, all right, let me go think about something else. Like, right. how do you think about, you know, writing the 12th or 14th or 19th paper about nice. deworming <laughs> or about advanced market uh, commitments? Like, that trade-off, obviously, in that you know, that's time that you're not spending, uh, you know, working on, uh, you know, housing discrimination or some other right. other topic. So, you know, I think I forgot to say what I think is one of the most important things about the, the sort of wave of RCTs that you know started with this work and in, in, arguably started with this work in Busia, there were RCTs before, definitely. You know, um, um, you know, there was the negative income tax and experiment in the seventies. There was uh, there were, in the U.S. There was a Rand health insurance experiment. I think the a key difference, and, uh, and most importantly for this crowd and interest in development, is Progresso, which was sort of simultaneous, you know, roughly simultaneous uh, with what we were doing, uh, which is a you know, wonderful achievement, you know, um, obviously with huge policy impact. Um, the, um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, you know there's, anytime you win a prize like this, you know, I think Esther Abidjan and I all feel this is really a prize for the field, and you know, we're thrilled we were selected. I'm not complaining, but you know, Santiago <laughs> Levy had a lot to do with this as well, and you know, Ted Miguel and you know, other people. So, um, um, so, um, um, so, anyway, to answer your question, I think that there's a really important difference between the sort of negative income tax and Rand Health Insurance experiment, and even Progressa, and um, the sorts of things that that you know, I think have. You know, taken off at really grand scale. Uh, obviously, Progress has taken off at grand scale as well. But the the but in the research side, uh, well, Progress has taken off on the research side as well. So not a good, I'm I'm not being precise here. But well, anyway, here's the, here's where I'm going with this. <laughs> it's <laughs> I think a key bit is that it's iterative. So you know, take this example on on um, on. I'll go with the water example, even though you mentioned others. You know, you don't. We first looked at protecting springs. And then we realized that, so this is just improving the water infrastructure, you know, the, where the water comes from. And what we found was there's a big reduction in E. coli counts at the site from this sort of installing infrastructure. But then the water that people actually, if you test the water in their homes, there was a reduction in, in E. coli counts, but not nearly as much. And the water was getting recontaminated. So then you start thinking about, okay, well now, you know, maybe we need to um, maybe we need something that's going to treat the water, and you know, water treatment, you know, chlorination, protects the water for for you know, 48 hours or, or or more. And so, if you keep uh, getting more chlorinated water, you'll you'll be okay. Um, and so, so that was a an, you know another level. And then, well, how do you design a system to 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 make it available and make it usable, make it convenient, get social norms there? That took a lot of additional trials. 
So you don't, it's not this, uh, um, it's not you wake up and you have the brilliant idea and it's there forever. You have to keep working at it and trying. And, you know, I would say that about, you know, I, I, I would say that about advanced market commitments as well. You know, I think I'm very happy about the advanced market commitment. So this was a, the idea of, you know, there's a big problem that, um, you know, the pharmaceutical firms and biotech firms, they have, they have, they have plenty in, of incentive to invest in, you know, cancer drugs or baldness drugs or whatever, but the incentives to invest in diseases that primarily affect poor people is much smaller. And then if they do develop it and they charge, uh, uh, you know, they, they follow their normal pricing strategy uh, or the profit maximizing, profit, you know, they might sell to the Brazils of the world but not the Mozambiques of the world. And or they might not even sell to the Brazils of the world. And, you know, that comes at a huge health cost. So the idea of advanced market commitments was let's, let's commit in advance that if somebody <coughs> develops a, a pharmaceutical or vaccine in this case, for a diseases of the poor, in this case, the strains of pneumococcus that were available, that, of, that are common in poor countries but not rich countries, then some donors will commit to help uh, finance the purchase of that. So I'm mostly you know, thrilled about that because you know, thanks, you know, we had this sort of, uh, you know, initially had a, a very different idea, which was patent buyouts, and then realized that was not gonna go anywhere politically switched over to this advanced market commitment idea, which I think is economically quite similar, or at least potentially could be. Uh, Rachel Glenister and I wrote a book on that called Strong Medicine, and you know, a book's great, but that's not gonna make the idea happen. What made the idea happen was the Center for Global Development set up a working group, which you know, Ruth Levine and I co-chaired, and Owen Barter was, uh, was uh, you know, the key uh, uh, person actually you know, doing most of the work, and um, you know, he, that was a lot of consultation with stakeholders, a lot of working through the details, and you know, the, the program, uh, and you know, uh, a number of donors put in $1.5 billion, and the vaccines were, were developed, and they're now reaching you know, hundreds of millions of people. So huge, and this is a disease that we're killing, I think, a million people a year. That's from memory, maybe I'm, I'm not exactly right. But, um, um, so that's great. <laughs> now, but was it perfect that time? No, you know, I, Remember, I think, you know, I remember at the time feeling like probably, you know, there's a debate over did, did it pay too much uh, or should they have, you know, just offered a lower price. And I certainly don't think that you could have just offered the manufacturing costs, which is sort of the, you know, extreme end of the, the position, then the pharmaceutical firms would not have gone along with it and we wouldn't have. Um, I personally at the time felt probably could, could have gotten away with a, a lower price. Other people on the you know committees felt that it was that you know they shouldn't take that risk, and it was better to go for a higher price and make sure it's developed. I totally respect you know one that you know totally legitimate views on both sides. I think probably they you know maybe did pay a, 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 you know more than was absolutely necessary. It was understandable decision at the time, but I think aside from that, I think there are other examples of of you know on my long to do list is to write a. Uh, a paper about other ways I think this could be improved. And I, I actually think the most important way is to not, and this is, might seem very counterintuitive, but we, the original idea was to do this for something like malaria, a much more distant technological target. There was a decision sort of at a political level to pick the target in advance and to focus on a near-term technological target that was not that, not such a big technological challenge, a pneumococcus. I personally think that it would be better to, um, to choose a distant technological target because then you, you're not risking you're not risking this you know um, this issue of well maybe if you t pay too much you're giving rents to a comp to a company you're just bringing in more you know creating greater incentives for more people to compete for that prize um, and I could go on about you know other other ideas but maybe that's another conversation. Yeah, no, no, I think, so that's consistent with a couple of things. One is seeing, as I look through these dozens of publications, you see them sort of fleshing out different pieces of the argument and also going to different audiences, mm -hmm. public health journals yes. and economics journals and foreign affairs kinds of journals. Um, and then also uh, uh, something from a, a previous conversation where I remember asking for advice about how to get from research to policy scale up and your main takeaway being like it's, much more work than anybody ever expects um, to get from the paper to somebody right. actually implementing that. Right. 
And re so related to that, uh, one of the things that's, that uh, I've seen in your work is trying to institutionalize some of this scale up. Uh, one example of that is the Development Innovation Ventures uh, program at USAID, which obviously is, there's a researcher hat there, but there's also a sort of deep policy engagement hat. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and, and that, that experience of shifting gears. You know, first, on the broader point about institutions being critical, you know, because this is a very different, you know, the the classic uh, uh, research production function in economics is, you know, paper and pencil doing theory, or you know, a computer and a and and, uh, and a researcher and maybe an RA doing uh, data work. Um, but you know, this production function involves huge teams of people and involves working with you know, many partners, NGOs, and governments, and so on. So that requires a bunch of infrastructure. So obviously, you know, a key part of that infrastructure is uh, is is JPAL. Um, but you know, there are many other organizations, IPA and and uh, and, and many others. So you know, the and and obviously, you know, um, you know, it's a huge achievement that uh, that um, that of, of you know creating those institutions like JPAL. Um, but you know, one area that I've been involved in, as you say, is development innovation ventures, and. I think that is is a a. Um, let me explain it for people who are not familiar. So it's it's a funder and it's an innovation funder. And again, I go back to this innovation theme. Um, but so it's um, so if you you could see it a little bit like a venture capital fund, uh, but for development. And you know the key key principles of it are first that we try to be. So this is part of U.S. Agency for International Development. And by the way, you know, if you have an idea, please apply, because what I'm about to say is it's open. Um, you know, anybody can apply. And the, it can be any country where USAID works. It can be any sector, you know, health, education, governance, whatever. It can, be, it can be that you want to scale commercially, like a social enterprise. Or it can be that you have an idea for an innovation in how governments work, and you expect governments to scale it with public funding. And the, it's, it's also tiered and evidence-based. So um, you know, part of what goes with being open across, across so many areas is, obviously, any agency like uh, USAID is going to want to choose some priorities. And obviously, you know, it's a $20 billion agency. They're going to focus. They're going to choose priorities. And you know, so for example, in health, they'll say you know, child survival, maternal mortality, totally appropriate decisions. But, you don't know what other ideas are out there. So it's good to, and priorities change over time, it's good to come up with things that are going to be tomorrow's priorities. And in health, one of the things, you know, communicable disease is going, is getting much better. And, you know, non-communicable disease is, 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 you know, is increasingly going to be the, the issue. So we try to be open, but you have to balance that openness because we're not going to spend the big bucks on just anything. So how do you do that? Well, you have a, the, the, we have, Funding for pilot testing and, and transitioning to scale, different size grants. The pilot we try to be you know quite open. Um, the testing, it depends what what that test consists of. If this is something that's supposed to scale through the public sector or with philanthropic funds, then that has to be rigorous evidence of impact and cost effectiveness. If it's and you need to test that, that doesn't have to be an RCT. Could be you know there's some other very you know very uh, convincing statistical techniques. In practice, most of our proposals we get are RCTs. On the on the um, if it's going to scale commercially, you know that's not really the critical thing. The critical for most things, if it's a solar lantern, you know if people are buying it, we can probably presume that they have a revealed preference for it and it's worth it to them. So if people are willing to pay enough for it. That this can be financially self-sustaining, that's and be a viable business, then that's great too, and that would be an alternative scaling route. But you have to show us that you know that's each case we try to be really rigorous, either really rigorous on the measurement of causal impact or really rigorous, like a you know a business person would be, is this really covering its costs? Not its you know not its costs in country, but not the oh you know the the, the central costs in in, in headquarters, um, you know. I, I could go on. Um, but then for things that pass that second stage, by the way, you don't have to have done the first or second stage you know, with DID funding, with any funding. Then for the most successful things, there's funds to help them transition to scale, precisely because you need a separate, 
You need additional work to, to transition to scale. So that's the, you know, that's, those are the principles. And I felt, you know, I was asked by Raj Shah to, to join USAID and I said, I've got, you know, commitments in, in Boston and, uh, and I, but I, I sort of counter proposed this and, and, uh, and we, you know, we wound up uh, uh, setting this up and, you know, Mark Green, the current administrator of USAID is, you know, a huge supporter as well. And, um, but it's time we set it up. You know, I felt that it was very important to recognize that the innovation process wasn't just the RCT, and but it included all these other elements, and you know, to be open to to a variety of places of types of innovators, and that we needed a larger ecosystem than than necessarily research funding would provide, and um, but that was theory, <laughs> and you know, the question was we set ourselves a target of a fifteen percent social rate of return uh, when we started. Um, and now, just in the past few years, I've had the opportunity to go back and take a look at our initial portfolio. And it, as, you know, as we've been discussing, it's a ton of work for, to, for innovations to scale, typically. And Facebook managed you know, pretty quickly. But you know, <laughs> in general, in development, if you look at oral rehydration therapy or you look at microfinance, these things were decades. So how are you going to evaluate impact? Well. You know, we started, if we, we've looked at our 2010 through 12 portfolio, and we tried to apply really rigorous standards to try and get a sense of, you know, what, how are we doing? And this is a very hard problem. It's often very hard to measure the, we know what our costs were, we know how much we spent. Very hard to measure benefits. Right? You know, even getting the data on how many people the innovations reached is often tough. Measuring the impact per person, you know, that's also tough. So, you know, data has been a big challenge in this area. So what we did is we decided we're going to take an ultra-conservative approach. We're not going to try to get an, for the nerdy people out there, we're not going to try to get an estimate of the impact. We're going to try to answer the simpler question of, was our rate of return, you know, over 15%? Was this a good investment? Well, Mitch maybe only requires a 10% rate of return. How did we do that? We said, let's just take those few innovations, which we know reached a lot of people, and where we can measure the, um, the benefits. And let's multiply the number of people reached times the benefit per person and get uh, benefits. For those, it turns out we've so far done that for four innovations out of our first 43 things we funded. Let's take the benefits from those four innovations and set that against the cost of what we invest in all 43. Well, it turns out that the benefits of those, those four innovations up through 2018, no future benefits imputed, that's five times the, the, uh, the cost. Okay? And that, you know, that corresponds to a 77% return. And that's, you know, I really want to emphasize, that's a, that's a lower bound, if I want to be nerdy about it. You know, the true rate of return is much higher because some of, many, you know, of those 43 innovations, 10 of them have gone over to reach over a million people. Hardly anything, by the way, in the social innovation sector gets to over a million. I mean, it's, it's actually, there's a bit of a crisis in the impact investing world because not that many things are scaling. So getting 10 out of 43 over a million and getting this incredible benefit cost ratio is, is I think, an evidence that this isn't just good in theory, but it's good in practice. And um, you know, I, think it's, uh, I, um, you know, I think it's wonderful that um, you know, you know, we've been able to do that and we're trying to you know, think about you know, um, what, you know, what are the what are the lessons? But I feel like the openness and the tiered evidence-based uh, funding approach are are you know really key. And there's obviously a lot of other things to, to discuss. But just really quick, what are what are a couple of those innovations that have scaled sure. really well? Um, well, I think my favorite example of this would be um, um, work by James Habirimana and Billy Jack. So these are two researchers at Georgetown, and um, and they, you know, they've both done work in East Africa, and James is, you know, originally from East Africa. And for those of you who've been to East Africa or much of the developing world, there are, there, you know, traffic accidents are very, very high rate of traffic accidents, and there are mini buses which are often a chief culprit in this, which drive like crazy because of the ways the incentives are set up for the mini bus drivers. They pay a fixed fee to the owner, and you know, they get to keep, you know, they make more journeys. They, they, they. They, that determines whether they make any money at the end of the day. And so, um, and you regularly see headlines of, you know, 
two of these things crash into each other and 40 people die. And the, um, their idea um, from spending time in the, in, you know, in the field and from, from being from East Africa originally was, to, was that I know when I write in these things, I don't that much now that I'm an old guy, but you know, when I was in my 20s, I did. And the, um, is, you, you want to ask the driver to slow down, but you feel terrible. Like, you know, you can't quite do that. They said, let's put a sticker in the minibus that says, if you feel unsafe, tell the driver to, to slow down. And they, th what they did was they worked with the insurance companies and the association of um, Matatu owners, and they did a trial on this. Actually, their first trial had nothing to do with DIV. It was outside of DIV. And there were you know, some problems in that. But similar to what you were talking about before, they were committed to actually not just writing a paper about this, but to A, trying to get their paper right, and B, trying to see if they could have some impact in the real world. So they went and did, they applied to DIV to do a, a better trial, to fix up some of the issues in the first one, and do it at larger scale. And you know, we provided, I think, a $200,000 grant. Well, they then demonstrated this very rigorously, published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, so one of the most prestigious science journals out there. After that, First, the Kenyan, the largest insurance company in Kenya, which is responsible for you know, more than half the market, made that a condition of insurance. So you had to have the sticker up to be to have your insurance. So the private sector was very heavily involved. It wasn't this model of, you know, we're going to start a business doing this. You, they tapped into an existing distribution network, if you will. One, the private sector, and two, the public sector, because the Kenyan government said, when you get your annual you know, renewal, you have to get of your of your license or your vehicle inspection or I don't know the details. Then you had to get one of these stickers as well, and um, you know that's estimate. You know the return on that. You spend two hundred thousand dollars. That's scaled up. Not at this point. I don't think any more U.S. taxpayer money is going in. Some philanthropic money is going in. But the big the big scalers of this are the Kenyan private sector and the Kenyan public sector. And so it's it's you know if I think about you know, the objective of USAID, it's the journey to self-reliance. You know, that is our, that's our mission. And, you know, this is, like many things in DIV, is an example of that. Because this is now being taken over, not, you know, it's no longer U.S. taxpayers paying for it. It's, it's primarily the private sector and the developing country governments themselves. And so I think we've seen a lot of examples like that. Some of them are you know, straight pub private sector, some straight public sector, but often it's a it's a, a it's a you know multiple actors working together. That's great. Happy to talk about other examples as well. Yeah, make it, have, make it I, I may not shut up. So. No, <laughs> well. super. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've had a what is for me delightful but surely inefficient monopoly on asking you okay. questions to this point. So I'd love to open it up a little bit and take some questions, and then we might circle back um, towards the end. I'll take, let's take a, a, a few at a, like a, maybe three to, to start out. I know we've got a couple. Um, all right, why don't we take uh, you, sir, and then, uh, and then you. Oh. Thank you. I'm John Kunrad with The Hunger Project and the Movement for Community-Led Development. I'm very interested in Kenya, so, and particularly on devolution and all the plumbing that uh -huh. would go into making that successful. Uh -huh. So I expect you've given thought to this big, large-scale political change uh -huh. in Kenya, uh -huh. and what might be the most useful, because it, my understanding is that the effectiveness of the decentralization has been good, right. but the effectiveness has been sort of mixed depending on levels of community engagement and capacity, and et cetera. What sorts of RCTs might be useful to do to m help us make the case for that kind of devolution elsewhere in Africa? Okay, so um, Michael, let's take one more. Just okay, to make sorry. Sure, yeah, yeah. Make sure yeah, yeah sorry. Few. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Tiago from the World Bank. Um, I've seen that uh, RCTs are great to find good ideas uh, for policies. I haven't been. I haven't seen them being used to cue bad ideas that much. Do you see a promising avenue for that to, to to use RCTs to explore policies that are being implemented and see if they're ineffective and cue them? Ah, right. Yeah. Okay, let me start with the, with that one. 
So, you know, I've focused, and I think maybe what excites me personally the most is RCTs as a tool in innovation and coming up with new approaches. Um, and uh, that's just like something about my, what I find fun, right? And I think that's, you know, I, th I also think it's very important and drives economic growth and all that. But it's also really important to understand whether your basic policies that you're spending lots of money on now are working. And there are also, you know, lots of examples, there are also lots of examples like that. I, I feel like, you know, these were often, now people are talking about RCTs. When we started out, we were talking about randomized evaluations. And you know, I don't think they're just about evaluations. They're also about beta testing in the innovation sense. But there are, all, there are all a bunch of evaluations out there um, that now, just because there's an evaluation and maybe it finds the program is not working so well, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be shut down. You know, there's political constituencies. I don't want to be naive about this, but I think it is is useful. And you know, another type of evaluation I think is is very helpful is if you find that something isn't working, then you can start trying tweaks on it. Or if it is working, you can try tweaks to to improve it. So you know, um, you know, if I think about Progressa, you know, that was actually a policy they were you know. It was an innovation, but it was a policy launched at, you know, with the intent of being Mexico's main anti-poverty program. And they evaluated it and they found out it worked. And that had an incredible policy impact because it wasn't just Mexico. Then, you know, so many countries have adopted conditional cash transfers. And then there have been a bunch of additional work to try to tweak it and make it better. And, um, and, and that's been, you know, very helpful as well. Um, on Kenya and devolution, so I'm working with um, uh, Pam Jakila, who's here at, at, uh, at CGD, and, um, and a number of other uh, co-authors. We did not start out to write a paper about devolution. <laughs> uh, we started to write out a paper, you know, we were, it was part of this water work. And one thing was, there was a question of, could you try to scale this up by working with local, very local politicians? And so we, did uh, RCT with extremely local politicians. That's actually pre the county system, the devolution, the new constitution. And you know, one question was, there are two questions about, about this. One was, are they just going to steal the money? Uh, another was, are they just going to be so biased that they'll put it in their home area? And you know, wound up, I think we actually now have a paper about devolution much more broadly, not about Kenya's devolution, because this was very, very micro, and Kenya's devolution is to the county level, which is much bigger. I'll just quickly indulge myself and tell you about our results. Um, the, um, um, the, what, we, what we found was that, um, so politicians have a very strong home bias. They very much want to put this in their, in their local community. And that matches a lot of other findings that politician identity matters. You know, in uh, Abonia, Washington, has these great results on the U.S. Congress that politicians with daughters are, sort of vote differently and maybe in a more pro-female way than politicians with sons. Um, so the um, so that that um, so this is a society, and any student of Kenyan politics knows that identity and and uh, origin is is important there. So. In a situation where local identity is very important, and also a situation with weak controls on corruption, you might think that if you do something that sort of forces people to spend money outside their home area, then they might be more tempted to steal it. And we saw there was a very strong interaction. So you know, we started, So basically, in some of the treatment arms, politicians had to spend money outside their home areas, and they were much more likely to sort of take the money. By the way, just to be clear, this was not public funds, this was research funds, it was tiny amounts of funds, so they weren't actually stealing any public money when they did this. They were being given an option that was totally, you know, they were totally allowed to do, so nobody, you know, did anything wrong here, but they, they had the option of, uh, of, of taking the money. That was how the, 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 the program uh, was designed. Um, and they could still deliver the service. Anyway, I won't go through the details. There was much more temptation to grab money when you weren't in your own home community. If you think about the design of constitutions, you know, if you're if in a situation like that where there's very strong home bias, there might be advantages to really decentralizing things a lot to very local areas, and um, you know, there are other institutions that could also address that problem to avoid the home bias problem. Things like civil service systems, where you rotate civil servants, or 
equal spending rules where you say, okay, there's a president, but they have, they're constitutionally constrained to spend equally everywhere. The problem is if you have weak control over corruption, then if they have to invest in an area they don't care about, then they're going to be tempted to steal the money. So I think the, you know, there's a theoretical result there, which I would not apply, say that, I would not say, oh, Kenya's constitutional reforms were good. I like him anyway, but not for this reason. Uh, it says, if he, you, in places with strong home bias and, lots of, and weak control over corruption, decentralizing some funds, for example, in Panchayat Raj, to the very local level may be actually a very efficient thing to do. We have time for some more questions. Um, let's, uh, again, I'd love to take a couple. Uh, certainly, uh, this person right here. People are still getting warmed up. I know it's pretty warm in here. Uh, it's probably all the brain power um, <laughs> emanating from the right side of the stage. But, um, and we also had, and then let's take uh, this lady and this gentleman over here. Yeah, thanks. Um, oh, and please, uh, uh, yeah, in case you forget, you know, introduce yourself and tell us where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Dalkian. I'm from Mongolia. Uh, I work at the Independent Research Institute of Mongolia. So I'm interested in the RCTs. Uh, in, I want to ask two questions. First one is um, RCTs in terms of the methodology and the funding and all of that could be very complex and <coughs> not very straightforward for local researchers in developing countries to implement and to like, um, professionalize in. Yes. So it could be quite exclusive and can be seen as a Western kind of people come to developing countries and do uh, experiments and go back. Yeah. And uh, so the uh, local population don't hear back the feedback, what happened, uh, how uh, the policy has been changed as a result of their cities and all of that. And so uh, I'm interested in hearing your opinions about this politics, like power dynamics, and mm -hmm. what are your intentions uh, in the future to more decentralize or more make it more like democratic and mm -hmm. inclusive mm -hmm. in terms of fields and also people? Mm -hmm. First question. Second question was I'm interested in uh, most of the targets for their cities are uh, poor people and right. people in developing countries. Have you considered or do you th see any future in conducting our cities for the rich yeah. In the Western countries, uh, how they maybe evade tax or what are their behavior and things like that? Has there been any such case? Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Zhe Cheng. Uh, I'm a student at Stanford University and interning at the World Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, as a development economist, uh, could you comment on the limitations on RCTs? Uh, so on one hand, there are a lot of things that are not RCTable, and on the other hand, even if they are RCTable, um, they're not always replicable. Hmm? A nice Thank new you. adjective, RCTable. RCTable. <laughs> Put that great. in the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, again, uh, sort of responding in reverse order. Um, so there's a ton of questions that you can't answer with RCTs, and, uh, or things that you could answer with RCTs, but you can also shed incredible light on with other techniques. So that's great. I'm not, I'm not saying you know, everything should be done through RCTs. So you know, I have the, you know, at Harvard, right you know, next to me are Melissa Dell and Nathan Nunn, who mostly you know, do, a lot, do a lot of work on economic history. Obviously, you're typically not going to be able to do an RCT there. Although, and I don't, uh, you know, one finding is there are many more things are RCTable uh, than, uh, than we thought. So, you know, wonderful work that Hoyt Bleakley's done on, in the U.S., there were lotteries to get land. And, he, you know, that allows you to get at some very fundamental questions about poverty traps and so on and, and in intergenerational income mobility. So you can take advantage of those, uh, the, you know, that's a natural RCT. It wasn't done for research purposes. It was done for fairness purposes in the 19th century. But um, um, so, um, sorry, the second part of your question, replicability. Yeah, so I think, again, this is part of what I would say about RCTs being an iterative process. So let me say a little bit more. The, the, Difference, you know, the, if you're talking about the negative income tax experiment, you know, that's a huge government program, a very, very expensive. The, I think part of the innovation was to say, actually, these can be done by an NGO, and there's a bunch of NGOs. They can't serve everybody. They, they don't have, you know, they don't have a, it's easier for them to make decisions and move quickly. And 
often, and then subsequently, even by with research funding, uh, you can you can do some things. Then, so that means if you do things at that scale, then you can potentially uh, do, make this an iterative process. So ultimately, the way we find out about you know, replicability or generalized you know, external validity, I mean, there are things you can do inside an RCT, but you can also just get accumulate data over time, and that. I think it's very, that's also very subtle. None of this is mechanical. If you're doing a meta-analysis, you have to think very hard. You have to apply the theory. And, and it, but if you do that, you can start to draw some lessons. So you know, my favorite example of this would be these results on preventive health, where obviously, you know, in one context, you've got malaria, and you should think about providing free bed nets. In another case, you don't have malaria, and, but you've got worms, and think about treatment of worms. But, the fundamental, they're, they're across many contexts, there's a, a lot of price, price sensitivity. The number of people who will use things uh, is much greater if it's free than if there's even a tiny charge. Um, so I think we can start to learn. Uh, so I think ultimately the solution is to, to do more, and that's doable because it is iterative. Um, the, um, um, okay, let me address the other very important questions. Um, so, you know, I do think that this is something that um, that has been done more by, you know, by researchers who are based in developed countries than by researchers who are based in developing countries. There are very important exceptions to that. You know, a key paper is uh, Chato Padaya and Duflo, for example, um, the, on reservations for women in, in, in Indian political system. Um, the, I, I think that it's very important to make one of the reasons why you know, DIV is open is because it's open to, it's intended to be open to you know, innovators, whether they're researchers or just social entrepreneurs or whatever they are, um, or just ordinary citizens, um, anywhere in the world. So we, you know, we are, we're very open in, in DIV to funding developing country researchers. Um, and most of our applicants are, uh, most of our successful applicants, I think it's the majority, are, have not gotten funding from USAID before. So we, we, now, I don't want to claim that it's just as, it, yeah, the, if you're from the US, you're more used to reading a call for proposals from, uh, from the US government. We're gonna try to translate the, I, my understanding, I hope I'm not, hope I'm not saying something I'm not. There's a, certainly discussion, and I hope there'll be implementation of trying to translate the basic forms into more languages to make it more accessible to more people. Um, um, the, um, but I think, you know, I think that what we need to do as a field, uh, um, um, you know, more broadly, is to try to find ways to improve. You know, I, one of the lessons of RCTs is, is that local knowledge is very important. And I think local knowledge is coming in, but that's not necess that's, that's not, you know, sometimes that's through local PIs, but it's not only through local PIs. There's often, you know, large teams involved in these, and people are coming in, uh, uh, knowledge is coming in from all the people in this. So that's happening. But I think it's very important to also develop local PIs and uh, principal investigators. Um, so um, I, I, I think that, you know, thinking about how we design funding to do that is very important. One thing that I think is very encouraging is that developing countries are increasingly setting up these programs. So uh, uh, Peru set up a very interesting program. Uh, Mexico has you know, passed an evaluation law. I think there's some, you know, I don't know where that stands politically with the new administration in Mexico. Um, and the and Tamil Nadu uh, has a whole set of innovate. They're testing a whole set of innovations. Um, so there are many developing country governments that can uh, could establish such funds, and I think that would be a step in the right direction. So then, if there's you know somebody has the advantage of knowing, you know, knowing how to read a proposal, well, it's you know it'll be the local researchers <laughs> who have that advantage. Um, I think there should be more international efforts. It's wonderful the World Bank is, is, you know, is very active in this area, which is great. Um, and I think they're making you know, tremendous strides through DIME and CIF and other, other programs. Um, the, um, one thing I will say, and this is a, another discussion, I feel like some of the, some funders, impose, the, the way they're going about trying to achieve this very important objective 
is not necessarily the most efficient uh, way to do that. I think sometimes some of the requirements that funders put in are, are not actually achieving the intended objective and are, are having um, maybe even counter negative effects in other areas. Um, so, um, so it has to be thought through carefully, but the objective is one I totally share. And as far as other fields, yeah, clearly have further to go, but one thing I would say is I feel like RCTs have actually helped move economics in the right direction of being much more open to ideas from other fields. There's a, not a coincidence you know, that there's so much work in behavioral development economics now because when you actually look at a problem, when you look at it in this iterative way, you know, before you would come on typical economics paper, I hate to say, from you know, a period before, was you come up with this anomaly, and then you come up with this really clever explanation of why it's all consistent with rationality. <laughs> but in the, if you weren't working iteratively, there's no opportunity to test that, so you'd paper, you know, the research inquiry would end then. This, you know, oh, it's actually rational, but it's just that they're playing this other game that we didn't realize they were playing, and that's, the, or there's this, and you wouldn't be able to test that, but it wouldn't be inconsistent with the facts, and your paper would be done. Well, now you can go back and test that, either in that paper or in the next paper or somebody else writing another paper in a totally different location. And what we found is that a bunch of things, you know, people are not always being rational. And that's partly why behavioral economics has come so strongly into development economics right now. But I don't think it's just psychology. You know, there's a lot to be learned, you know, health professionals, you know, I get, you know, my big insight into education that I was so proud of, like, well, you know, teachers could have told you that. You know? um, so, um, and so I, I think that there's a lot to gain from other, other fields, and I think we're increasingly doing that and having these interdisciplinary teams. Again, something that I completely agree we need to go in that direction, but again, many of the um, sort of uh, uh, funding requirements that are imposed are doing that in a very you know, ham, ham handed way. Um, and, I think there are better ways to do it. Yeah. Oh yes. So there's there's uh, there's indeed a, a you know a lot of very interesting experiments going on in the U.S. and I think this is you know an example you know if we think about um, I, I, I'm sure that I'm not being uh, sufficiently nuanced here, but. It's often claimed that there are benefits of uh, development assistance for uh, for the developed world. Well, I think this is a case where okay, not only not nuanced, but you know, a bit a bit, a bit presumptuous, but hey, uh, uh, the you know, I think RCTs are a new technology for doing research to address a wide variety of, of social issues, and they're one that was, you know, I think. There were definitely precursors in, 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 in developed countries, you know, so there, I do want to acknowledge that. But I think it came to its, there were a lot of developments of the methodology for doing this, both technically and institutionally, in, in developing country settings. And that is now coming back very heavily to the U.S. And you've seen all sorts of, of social experiments in the U.S. Um, I think, um, you know, there's, uh, and I don't just want to say the U.S., you know, France and and uh, many other countries as well. So um, there's, I think there's a lot of scope for that, and it's increasingly common. I just add one of uh, Esther Duflo's most highly cited papers is a study of a randomized trial trying to get adults to, or seeing how to encourage adults to invest in retirement accounts at a major university in the U.S. And so it's definitely a part of that, a part of that movement. Um, we have time for uh, for a few more, uh, perhaps you and you, and do we have, uh... all right, we're going in twos today, all right. Uh, oh, and uh, and we'll take this third gentleman here at the after. Congratulations, and my name is Rafael, I'm from Brazil, I'm intern in Dine right now in the World Bank, and after the prize, uh, I think more people will be interested in, in being in the field, and in being the, in the RCT field and development field, I want to know what is what is your biggest advice for these people that is beginning right now, and the people for that will be interested to get in these fields in the future. Great. Uh, so I think one, you know, this is a field where there's a lot of implicit knowledge, and I talked about this all, all this work all has 
has to be done by teams of people. And so I think joining a team like that can be, you know, very, you know, it's a, it's a great career step, both because you learn about how to do this type of work, but also because you're immersed in the reality of a developing country. Obviously, you're from a developing country or from a rural area of a developing country, you know, from a, from a, not from the you know, total elite of a developing country, then you're already very familiar with it. And even if you're the elite, you're familiar with some aspects of it. Um, but if you don't have that, then, it's, then you're getting a twofer. You're both learning the techniques and the approaches, and you're, you're, you're learning about you know, what the realities are on the ground. And so that's one step. And then I think the other step is just getting the right technical uh, training. And that, you know, I'm an economist, so I think about, you know, I know the technical training you need in economics, but it doesn't have to be in economics. If you're in public health or you're in education, you know, I think there's actually arguably you know, really big gains from, you know, in other fields, or political science, um, um, from getting the, the, the technical training in whatever your field is, and then, um, and then combining that with some sort of the knowledge that you pick up through experience. Yeah, I'll just, I'll actually just a little tidbit, which is that my very first working experience in graduate school was helping to set up an agricultural experiment pilot working for Michael Kramer. So getting that field experience, and it served me pretty well, I'll say. So uh, let's go ahead and take three, if we could take uh, this, this lady, and then this gentleman, and then the gentleman over there. Do we have a... I've got a mic, so should okay, I start? Okay, we'll start with you. Uh, my name is Kamiar Kajavi. I work at uh, Management Sciences for Health and run the Joint Learning Network. Um, I think that uh, the um, medical field has gone through some soul searching over the last 10, 15 years about how studies are done um, to avoid things like publication bias. And I'm just wondering, in the, the area of development, what kinds of things have, are we learning from them to make sure that our results are more kind of reliable and um, stable? So and let's actually let's hold. Oh, on yeah, I'm sorry. This, yes, yes. Take, yep. So if we could get a mic over to, okay, this lady here. Thank you. So uh, one of the questions. Uh, I'm Shoini Sarkar. I'm with an international NGO, um, and right now actually I have been working on a project with youth and peace building. And so we have been training the youth on conflict analysis and conflict mapping and so on and so forth. So with RCT, my question is. Can we look at it as a way of thinking? And even when at the community level, let's say, if, even if people don't have the technical knowledge to run RCTs, is there a way that they can think about problems which sort of mirrors the way you would go up setting so that you know when they do problem solving at the community level, they can kind of mirror the inherent logic behind mm -hmm. RCTs. Mm -hmm. And congratulations, the day you got the award, I was in Calcutta. And Banerjee happens to be from my alma mater. So oh. one of the thing I was curious about is how did the three of you get to work together? Like, mm. how did your paths cross? Right. That's great. And let's take one more. Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Serin Ture. I am originally from the Gambia, but I currently work at the World Bank. Um, and uh, first of all, congratulations on the award. Uh, my question is basically on um, to what extent do you consider the multidimensionality of um, the challenges and difficulties that uh, poor people face uh, in doing RCTs, particularly for poor, poor uh, interventions? Uh, and and this uh, I'm asking this um, across the entire phase of, of the RCT process, from identifying individual challenges uh, that are uh, poverty that are facilitating constraints to or that are acting as poverty traps and also to the point of identifying some of these innovative ideas to tackle um, the challenges that 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 uh, poor people face so to what extent does the multi-dimensionality of, of poverty factor into the entire process thanks okay so multi-dimensionality of problems faced by the poor sort of imitating the model of RCT and problem solving and sort of working together with Astra and Abhijit and learning from medicine on sort of reducing bias? Easy questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so multidimensionality, you know, problems are certainly multidimensional. Um, I, I think that, um, and you know, it's correct that RCTs are trying to isolate the impacts of specific things. So, um, but I would say that one of the, you know, RCTs can also be used to examine the interactions. Um, so, 
Um, you know, I referred to earlier to the debate between the liberals who say just spend more on education and the conservatives who say spending does nothing, it's all about incentives. There's a very nice recent paper by, uh, by uh, Isaac Mbiti and uh, Kartik Murliteran and I feel terrible for the other co-authors who, who I'm not, uh, not mentioning right now, but, but, uh, um, but Isaac and Kartik are, are friends of mine, so I remember them. Um, the, um, the, um, you know, they look at this in Tanzania and they say, well, what they show is that there's complementarity because some arms looked at incentives alone, some looked at you know, resources alone, and what they find is you need both of them, or the both they, they ha you get a bigger impact from providing both than just than you would get by providing one one at a time. Um, that's of course just one element of still within education. There's no reason why you couldn't do RCTs of a of a of a of a multi-dimensional program and then compare it to each of the individual subcomponents and see if you get a, a super additive effect or a, or one that's actually smaller than the sum of the parts. Um, so I think that it is important to get the multidimensionality. And of course, RCTs are going well, well beyond of the simple economic uh, issues, you know, to take up this issue of, you know, transition a little bit into the peace building issue. But there's wonderful results on, on, on peace building, on the impact of cognitive behavioral therapy or of on, uh, on violence, showing tremendous reductions in violence from cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's, you know, that's a really a medical or uh, uh, intervention at some level. Um, the, um, there, and people are also looking at the economic impact of treating depression. Uh, um, so so um, I think it is really possible to apply this technique much more widely. You raised a you know, really interesting question, which I find fascinating, which is, is this something that, you know, so no question, this is tough, right? You, you need, there's selection bias, there's a ton of things, but, but is there a way to do this in a, if I want to be a little bit Silicon Valley-ish, uh, you know, worth doing, um, you know, maybe we could crowdsource these things and maybe we could, maybe we can democratize it you know, radically. So I'm very excited about the potential uh, for digital development. And one of the areas, I'm not you know, working in, in the, the you know, critically important governance area, but I am working in the agriculture area. Well, if you think about how do agricultural scientists do their work, it's an RCT, it's an agricultural experiment in very carefully controlled conditions. That's great and definitely fundamental to science. I do not think that's a mistake because it's not real. No, you learn the basic scientific principles then and then you think about how you apply them. Again, an iterative process. Um, but, the, but you also want to know how do they work in a real world farm case? And how does that vary by the farm characteristics? Well, here's a question. I, don't, I certainly haven't figured out how to do this yet. But you could imagine signing up a bunch of farmers, trying to train them to do an agricultural experiment on their own land the results will be useful for them because they'll find out in my particular circumstances, you know, what's the impact of this, you know, adding lime to treat acidic soil, for example. Um, but, and if you could get that information back from them, either by them reporting it, uh, because they're part of a collective group that's been, you know, that's agreed collectively, a bunch of farmers in our region are going to try out lime and see what the impact is, uh, or because you're collecting information using satellites. <laughs> um, you, know, you could imagine people doing decentralized experiments and then aggregating all that information up and feeding it back to people. And I think you know, that's just one example of a very exciting area of, of digital development and digital agriculture in particular. And I've actually you know, helped found an NGO to, uh, um, that's called Precision Agriculture for Development, which is doing some stuff in that area. It's not yet doing the particular, you know, the, this particular thing, but I would love if it, if it could. So maybe down the road, we'll, we'll do that. Um, Esther and Abhijit, yeah, we were friends. We worked together. You know, we have a lot of co-authored papers. Um, and, you know, I would say, you know, one example of, um, I'll just give it a, so when Dave was summarizing my papers and he, he sent me a copy of the, the summaries and he, he said, I noticed that your, your paper on, how we can solve the AIDS problem by people having more sexual partners uh, did not, you know, wasn't, you know, prominently cited by the Nobel Committee. And, uh, 
And indeed, <laughs> you know, I do have such a paper. And, you know, I think this points to a larger issue. I sort of like the paper in some ways. But, you know, economists had been trained, and just to sort of explain, you know, for the, uh, for the younger generation, like why this was an important innovation. You know, there's a lot of value on showing technical, you know, technical uh, ability in formal modeling, mathematical modeling in economics. And for good reasons, we've accomplished a lot with that. But um, so, and particularly if you can show an unexpected result based on, you know, the classic, what you try and do in a math theorem is you try and start with, you know, take something and then you, you know, how many triangles can you fit, or how many, and you come up with the answer that's two over pi for some, you know, unfathomable reason, and then you lay out the logic, and, you know. So, you know, I was very, very early in my career, I started reading some of the literature in mathematical biology, and I realized that you could come up with a theoretical example in which, actually, if people had more partners, you could reduce the transmission of disease, and in fact, eradicate the disease. And that's, that was at least theoretically possible. In the, um, and so I you know, wrote this paper. Abhijit was my you know, somewhat more experienced colleague. And I told him about the result. And you know, he went over the math. And you know, there wasn't a problem in the math. But at one point, he said, you know, the best type of paper is one where no, you know, after the paper is written, everybody thinks that was completely obvious, and we should have known that from the beginning. Because it actually is not just like demonstrating some technical, you know, wow, look what I can do. It's actually addressing a real world problem and trying to come up with not just a theoretical possibility, but what's actually the right answer, you know, trying to get at the actual truth. And so, you know, much as I love that paper, uh, I, think, I think that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the develop, there's been a, I think RCTs are that as part of a larger you know, shift in economics that's really focused on saying let's let's try to really understand what's you know what's really happening, um, and you know we will try and use advanced uh, techniques when they're helpful. But if a simple technique will solve the problem, then you know, that's fine too. I guess um, I guess that you know relates to the other question, which is um, about you know. The medical world has obviously been using RCTs for a very long time, and you know that, and they've found that there are problems with the way they've been using them. And that, again, when I talk about the iterative nature of things, that applies to the whole field. So, you know, one of my early papers on RCTs was Ted McGill talking about what happens in an RCT when there can be when there's the for say uh, um, this was on deworming, and in the case of deworming, if the treatment group is a, is dewormed, they might spread the be, they might actually be less likely to spread the disease to the comparison group. And so we worked out, we showed that that was a problem in the context we were looking at. We showed that led to underestimation of the impact. Um, and we worked out some technical approaches for, you know, for addressing that. There's been, that's a tiny element. In general, there's been all these methodological improvements that, the, that have, have been developed over time. Um, one particular area relates to issues like publication bias, research transparency, et cetera. One, one, there's one, um, one step that I think is you know, unambiguously good, which is trying to get more trial registration so that people know about the trials that have been done. So you don't, if, if only the successful trials are published, then, uh, then people don't somehow get the wrong idea because all five trials were of this particular approach were successful but they don't realize that there were 90 other trials that were unsuccessful that never got published. So I think that's, that's important. There's other, other approaches like um, uh, pre-analysis uh, you know, um, pre statements. Um, I've, you know, I think there's a very strong case for pre-analysis statements. I also see the case where they can, you know, I also see problems with them. I don't think, I'm not sorted out in my own mind exactly what my view on them is. I think, but I think it's a very productive discussion. And I think over time we can, you know, some people will probably opt for pre-analysis statements. Other people might choose not to do them. Other people might do things that are somewhat, I think there's opportunities in, in a social science context to do things a little bit differently than in medicine. And it may make sense to do 
exploring something I would call sort of two-stage analysis, where you look at some results beforehand, um, uh, some aspects of the data beforehand, and then that helps you. One of the issues in social science, there's so many possible hypotheses, so many possible channels, it's hard to write down a comprehensive pre-analysis statement. So I'm interested in the idea of don't look at your main outcome variable ahead, but look at some other things, understand uh, understand the data better, and then use that to look at the, the then, then write down exactly what decisions you're gonna make to get at your main outcome. This is a fluid field. I think there's a lot of very interesting developments. Clearly we have a lot to, a long way to go. So one uh, interesting fact on that, just in the last two weeks, uh, a paper came out on the adoption of these methods like trial registries mm -hmm. and pre-analysis plans in four social science fields, including economics, mm -hmm. written by Ted Miguel, who is an early student of, of Michael's, and Garrett Christensen, who is a student of Ted's. So we've got some multi-generational sort of uh, impacts going on here. So we've grilled you for about an hour and a half. We're gonna wrap it up uh, just, and we've got, we hope you'll stay, that we got a, a reception outside to celebrate uh, Michael's uh, receipt of the Nobel. I just love to give you the last word. Obviously, uh, the Nobel gives you a platform, uh, a new elevated platform. And uh, I'm curious if you have any advanced views on what you're hoping to use that platform for? Well, uh, I, I, I'll need to think about that more. Uh, but, um, but you know, I think the, you know, the fundamental, you know, the, the fundamental thing that drew me to development was that I think there's a moral imperative to address problems that you know we can, we can address, and you know I think that it's important not to lose sight of that. So um, I think there are all sorts of ways in which you know, we, can, um, we can use you know, RCTs and other scientific approaches to learn more about how to do that better. And then I think it's also important to try to think about how to connect um, you know, research to, to policy um, and to be involved in that. And, um, and I think innovation uh, can be a very important part of that. And so I would, I would like to try to do that um, in some way, both through my own research, but I hope through, um, through you know, more broadly than that. Um, and you know, I'm excited about, there are a bunch of areas I'm excited about. I'm excited about this <coughs> approach that's in, the DIB uses, but that I think could be used much more broadly to try to expand this and really try to have this reach many, you know, have many more people involved in this, including Critically, uh, m much greater representation of researchers in developing countries. Um, um, I'm excited about digital development, including in agriculture. Um, so there's a lot of areas that I'm, I'm excited about, um, and um, you know, would try to use this, you know, both to support those areas, but also just to support the entire uh, research community and the entire development community. Well, we look forward to having you back to the Center for Global Development to keep talking about those. Let's all give uh, Michael Kramer a big round of applause. Thank you. And as I said, please join us for, uh, for a reception afterwards to celebrate this, uh, this great uh, achievement. Thank you. <laughs>